Welcome in, everyone, to a special Wednesday night edition of the Barking Browns. My name's Casey. I'm with Mr. Nick Carnes, and our boy Jacob is on assignment. He won't be here this evening, so you're stuck with us. We're going to do our cornerback review, and this video is brought to you by Almage Apparel. Check out the threads. They always look for the H on the arm. Make sure you get legit the best apparel you can get, comfortable and uh, stylish. Nick's got the NFL jam. That that is a sick shirt. I love Um, it. Yeah, man, that's that, that's that's iconic, man. Those two those two faces, we're gonna think back thirty years from now, and those two dudes are are gonna be etched in our hearts forever. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, we're just gonna jump in, man. Nick, how we doing tonight? Hey, man, I'm I'm good. Uh, you know what? And, and I just want to say to everybody, sorry for the Wednesday episode. That's on me, right? So we're we're just shuffling the cards all around. But but I'm good, man. We we've got s- some stuff to talk about. We've got some training camp dates. On the horizon, we're going to get into here shortly. But you know, all of a sudden, you you look at it and you're like, "Hey, we're like about a month out here from mm-hmm. from getting some real serious." Fo- and and I don't know. I I promised myself I was going to maximize the summer, and suddenly suddenly it's about the end of June. I don't know where all the time went. Well, don't blame yourself for the change up. Variety is the spice of life. So this is well, the Wednesday night shake up. I think you know, it's just a little good. Give, give people keep people on their toes. You yeah. know. Keep Absolutely. people looking. But uh, to your point, man, yeah, it's the 26th right now. And on the 25th of July, they go to the Greenbrier. And they'll be there through August 2nd. And they did just announce six dates that will be open to the public uh, when they come back to Berea. And it's going to be August 4th, 6th, 8th, 12th, 20th, and 21st. Those are the six dates that will be open to the public. I know on July 17th, uh, you'll be able to start purchase- purchasing those for season ticket holders. Oh, I see you down there. I see you. <laughs> it's your tatas. Um, and, and each date's like associated with a different cause or something sponsoring it. Uh, I don't know all of them particularly. I know the 20th is Military Appreciation Day. So if you're available, if you're in the area, man, go. Go mm-hmm. see it live. You know what I mean? It'll be hot. Take water. Get some sunscreen. People yeah. forget the sunscreen, dude. And then they take a beating out there in the sun. Well, you'll cook. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll cook. Have you? You've been to those in the past. Do you plan on going to any this year? Yeah. Um, you know what? So something I've always appreciated from the Browns is just that they're free uh, and that it's a first come, first serve type thing. And most of them, I saw that some of the times are different for the first time in a long time because honestly, I've been so so for uh, just a little peek behind the curtain. I start my, my work day about 3 a.m. So normally mm-hmm. I'm, I'm done somewhere around 11 noon so like the 2 p.m practices were always perfect you know it's like i'd get some lunch i'd go there i am in bria no problem um but this year i see a bunch of these practices are like four something like that so so definitely a little different um but yeah i've I've, so but basically what i'm saying is a lot of them are during the weekend so there's 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 still a ton of people there but it's not the sold out type situation Mm -hmm. that the weekends are so i've been able to to get to a ton of these um because they're just first come first surf and so no that's that's one thing you are out in the sun there is no shade for you uh, unless you are sitting vip getting getting free drinks served to you so you will cook uh bring the sunscreen i I can tell you yeah i can tell you that i've left quite a few days with a a burnt head from the experience i'm gonna put this on jw johnson man get some shades out there get those get those little tarps that you can like hang up over the stands and keep these people uh from baking out in the open sun. And that, that's kind of crazy too, because if you think about it, you would think they would want to hold practice either early in the morning or later in the day to right. avoid the, the high heat. But two o'clock, that's like as bad as it gets during that time of year. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, to your point, I, I didn't list all the times for each of the days, but they're all listed at different times. So go to clevelandbrowns.com. All the dates are there. And if you're in the area, I highly suggest you try to make it to at least one of those practices, man. It's, that's, that's a special thing. Yeah, I put it in my calendar. Let's see. I have the because 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 especially for the um, so now that the Browns go to the Greenbrier, there's a lot less dates than there used mm-hmm. to be. You used to get like a solid like a Saturday, Sunday, uh, two Saturdays and two Sundays that you had opportunities to go to. Now it's a lot different. So um, July 18th, 10 a.m., the tickets go live for anybody that's like racing to get one of the weekend dates because uh, there's only like six, which. I mean, selfishly, I wish there were uh, a ton more practices in Berea like there used to be. But if going to the Greenbrier helps you, then then so be it. Um, I think there's one Saturday and one Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, for everybody that does work a typical nine to five. 
Yeah, I, I know some people are bummed that it's only six, but six is better than none. Right. And based on the way the team was able to bond and come together at the Greenbrier, I'm all for them doing that again. I have I have one personal request. I'm I'm gonna I think I'm gonna tweet it out before uh, training camp goes live because in 20, 2022 was my favorite year of training camp because for whatever reason the Browns decided that year that they were gonna come out with uh, specifically branded for that year gear mm-hmm. that like you could buy like a shirt that said Brown Cleveland Browns training camp 2022 and there was a hat too and that's when they they introduced the charging elf which yeah. um, it I have right there but uh, I'll, I'll bring it next week um, but anyway my point is that gear was awesome and I thought like it was a really cool way to uh, like you like commemorate hey I came up to training camp I was here and like you know it's unique gear that you're not gonna get any other time of the year right it's like specific to, and i thought that was special um and for whatever reason last year they just didn't do it anymore i don't know if it didn't sell well enough or whatever i loved it i don't know i, I i'll tell you what casey i'm gonna grab I'm, I'm gonna go two feet and i'm gonna grab this hat uh real quick because i gotta show you guys I, it's just it's one of those things that like you had to have if you had went that year well <clears throat> one thing i think is special if you if you have young kids to be able to take them to this kind of event to see the players up close and not on television and not from the stands to see it on the practice field, man. And if they're really into football, I would do that. I've never gotten an opportunity to go to a pro practice. Uh, but if you have some have kids in, who are really into the Browns, man, this is a super cool thing that you should take advantage of. Oh yeah. And, and sources are saying that, that some of us may be there on August the 4th uh, sources have, uh, are saying, uh, but, yeah, but yeah, so here, and oh, I, let's I, go. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. It's like a, it's like kind of a trucker hat. Right. Yeah. But it's like, you know, we all went together and we got matching hats for that year. And like, it was, it was awesome. Right. So like, th- this is one of the biggest, I'm, I'm going to post this on Twitter and see if we can, we can get the people, we can rally the Browns people to, to give us more gear because, because Tag like, JW man, right. He's the one, right. he's the guy who makes all that stuff happen. Like how could you, and like the, there's the shirt basically is exactly mm-hmm. the same with this logo, like this is, this is some of the best stuff they did. And I'm, I'm going to stand firmly on that hill. Anyway. No, that's badass, man. And you're hundred percent right. Like you make it a special event. You know what I mean? Get, get some specialized merch. And then say, cause you always look back, man. You, yeah. you remember that training camp of 2022? Right. Is that, is that the training camp where Jacob got the Nick Chubb helmet? It is the training camp where Jacob got the Nick Chubb. Because that's where, that's when he signed his extension. If I, I believe it was 21 or 22. Maybe sources can confirm or deny that. I guess. Yeah, I guess I can't remember. But yeah, I believe Jacob did get the helmet then. That's wow. You know, time flies, man. We got to get you up here, Casey, for one. of I know. I know, man. I know. I'm uh, hoping to transition out of my current gig, which kind of locks me down uh, and try to get something that's more mobile. But we'll we'll see. See how that goes. There's a great little establishment down the street that we may or may not visit after camp. It's a, it's an experience if you, for anybody who wants the, who, who does come. I'm all about establishments and, uh, and celebrating my victories. Oh yeah. All right. Let's transition here, man. So earlier today I was on sports for CLE, which tomorrow Nick will be making his sports for CLE, CLE debut. I will. At uh, at four forty. So four if, four. If you're not doing anything, get on Cleveland.com or on YouTube on Cleveland.com and uh, check out Nick as he makes his debut. And I was on today and uh, Dave brought up this article by ESPN where they ranked all 32 franchises by their starting lineups. They had the Browns at 12, which we've seen countless uh, roster rankings this offseason. The Browns are consistently in the top five. Consistently, Right. Right. Okay, so we're going to do a little exercise here. I'm going to run down all the teams that are in front, currently in front of Cleveland. All right? And you tell me whether yay or nay. Okay. They have the 49ers at one. Yay. The Chiefs at two. Chiefs at two. Mm-hmm. Yay. Okay. The Ravens at three. Oh. I'll tell you what, man. I I think we've talked about this on on the show before. I'm not I'm not the biggest believer in the Ravens this year. Like I still expect them to be competitive and mm-hmm. and because and, they always are. Yeah, yeah, they, they they always are. But you know, essentially, it's it's like they they've uh, they've got Zay Flowers and they've got Mark Andrews on offense, and they drafted Devontae Walker and re-signed um, 
His name escapes me Rashad right now. Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just don't – I have questions about those weapons. And, and yes, I know they, they signed Derrick Henry, but there are there is a lot of miles on yeah. them, their tires. So – I'd add Isaiah likely to their weapons, Cache. Yeah. yeah. But where I get tripped up with the Ravens is they're transitioning to three new starters on their offensive line. That's that's a, that's tough, man. Yeah. You, you know who you play? You know what I mean? Like right. playing in our division with three, I guess. Yeah, that's that's a tall task. And on top of that, you lose um, a nice chunk of your whole defensive staff that, you know, the, the I, I still expect the Ravens to have a good defense, but it's like coaching does matter too. And mm-hmm. when your guys are, are getting farmed out to, to head coach in Seattle, to D.C. and in, in Tennessee, well, we, we saw that exact thing happen to the Eagles after the Super Bowl, right? Their offensive yeah. defensive coordinators went to become head coaches, and they were not the same the right. following year. And I'm not saying they won't be. Uh, and we're going to hear their name before ours as well. So I'll, I'll keep going down the list here. Okay. So that was the Ravens at three. They have the Jets at four. The Jets at four. For me, this feels like a very quarterback-weighted thing. Hmm. That's like, – there's so much. That's a whole lot of expectation being put on on Aaron Rodgers. A Rogers. lot of projection there, right? Coming in his in his forties, coming off an Achilles tear. That's that's. I don't know, man. I don't know. I, like, is Mike Williams going to be healthy for them? I love Brees Hall and, and Garrett Wilson, obviously. Yeah, that's a very good defense. I'll give them yeah, that. Very good. Sure. Questions Sean's on partner. offensive line? They went and got some old dudes. Right. You know, um, is is Tyler Conklin going to get it done at tight end for them? I. I mean, that's a, that's an awful lot of 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 belief in Aaron Rodgers. I, I need to see it first. Here's one that I, that I think is borderline: the Lions at five. The Lions at five. I think the Lions have a ton of talent. They do. They have they a very do. good offensive line. Right. They have a couple question marks on defense. Um, Jameer Gibbs just came in and had a great rookie season. David Montgomery. They have a nice one-two punch back there. Right. I'm on Ross St. Brown. Um, drafted after Anthony Schwartz. I'll never let that go. Um, no, don't, don't hold on I, to that I'm one. I'm holding on to that one. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jameson Williams was a first round pick, so we'll see. I mean, it hasn't been a yeah, great Sam Laporta had an awesome rookie year at tight end. Right, see if he can right. build off that. And and Jared Goff, man, Jared Goff, uh, still somehow like 30 years old. Feels like he's been in the league for forever. So I was I'm doing uh, research on an article about uh, Jameis Winston. And in 2019, Jameis Winston led the league in attempts, yards, and interceptions. He had okay. 626 passing attempts in 2019. So did Jared Goff. When I, wow. I, I did not see that coming. When I was like looking at girls, like who? Who I was like, who was the next closest? And it was tied actually. That's crazy. So, yeah, Goff's in a weird position too because like he was like jettisoned away from the Rams. Goes to Detroit, has a couple down years, and now, now he feels like he's viewed in a more positive light. Yeah, that um, that swap they did with Matt Stafford. I mean, I know Stafford got the Super Bowl and, and you know the Rams, but it's not like the the Lions have benefited a lot too, which is really interesting. I, you know, kudos to Goff. I, I think I would, I think I would put the Lions roster. A, their defense is not does not move. They have a few question marks. Uh, yeah. I will agree. They do have a few question marks. Uh, Cowboys at six. The week the week one up, up against the Browns here is coming up at number six. I'm not a big believer in the Cowboys, man. You're trotting Zeke Elliott and Rico Dowdle. You out there. Really see, bad. there you go. That, that is that that. That is CD and what? Jake Ferguson at tight end. I don't. Ferguson's, I like Ferguson, but it's like, you know, outside of CD, it's 32, 33 year old Brandon Cooks. And I think, and actually, I think Cooks younger than that. He just feels like he's ancient. Okay. I think he's, he's in a 2014 class. So he's probably 31. I mean, not much younger. 31. It's not like okay. Ring okay. chicken, but uh, may, maybe 31 turning 32. I just, um, you know, it kind of seems like the whole offense is CD Lamb. And that's, that's a, and, and, and they also lost Dan Quinn. Who uh, really turned around was it was the beginning of the the Dallas's defensive turnaround. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I got questions there too. I expect the Browns to be Dallas. So I'm not I'm not putting no I'm not doing it. I'm not putting Dallas above above the Browns. I've reached my my. We're going to hate number seven then. Okay. Cincinnati Bengals come in at seven. Absolutely not. Right. No. 
that you no, no. All right. <laughs> There's still massive questions at, at their offensive line. They mm -hmm. have now I get it. Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, that's a dangerous duo. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike Kosicki, I am still waiting for for uh, I've been burned by him in fantasy a gazillion times. Um, but uh, like their defense took a step back last year after they lost a bunch of talent. Um, they still, you know, Joe Burrow's coming back from injury as well. And uh, no, no, the Browns on the Bengals. No, that, that's the thing that's weird is Joe Burrow has many of the same things going against him. The, the Watson has going against him, but it's not painted in the same light at all. It's funny. You know, it just crazy D dudes only finished two seasons of his four in the league. Yeah. You know, and don't get me wrong, man. He's highly skilled. Oh, and yeah. maybe we just have a, a, a skewed perspective because personally we've had so much success against him as a player because I really can't discount who he is as a player. He's an excellent processor, a uh, great anticipatory thrower of the football, but I'm not sure he's built for this. I'm just not. Right. And so. and I'm not sure if they can protect him. They haven't protected him well yet. Right. And, and you're saying you he know, doesn't for, do a good job of protecting himself either. True. He doesn't realize how frail he is and tries to keep plays alive too long. And it's I, I hate to be that guy, but like we saw how his baby hands didn't react well in the rain. Yeah. Like him not having big mitts. People can be like, yeah, it's overblown. Yeah, is it? When you play in the AFC North and have to play in bad weather, not always, not always. All right. Number eight's the Texans. I'm surprised the Texans are are not higher because I would take the Texans roster over the Bengals roster for sure. And the Cowboys. And the Cowboys. Yeah, yeah. And I the would, Jets. I would, yes. Yes, I would. I would take. I, yeah, absolutely. I would. I, I'm a, I am as big of a Nico Collins fan as there is. That dude is, mm -hmm. is special, and it just took him to get a quarterback. Tank Dell lit the league on fire. And and I, I don't think Stefan Diggs is dust. I, I just don't. Uh they they have Dalton Schultz and, and Joe Mixon and 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 of CJ. We haven't even mentioned CJ Stroud. They just mm -hmm. they they traded for Daniel Hunter, right? Yes, they did. Or, yeah, they yeah. they and Grenard actually went to Minnesota. So they right. didn't trade them, but they did swap. They did swap them. Okay. Um and, and they've got some pieces on defense there. Mm -hmm. I, like if you if you said would I pick the Texans or the Bengals or the Texans or the Jets, I'd pick the Texans in both scenarios. Yeah. So, like do, just I, I, I do think that they bolster well around Stroud. Obviously the one two punch, uh because they went and got mixing. Mm -hmm. And then uh but here's I do think we're in for a little bit of regression from Stroud. Not because Stroud's gotten worse, he's probably even gotten better. But there's a lot more tape on him now, and defensive coordinators have had an entire offseason sure. to dissect how to attempt to defend the kid. It'll be up to him to come up with a counterpunch to that. But that's why the sophomore slumps are a real thing for the vast majority of quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. You know, and it might it might just be a slight downturn where they've they've been able to take a few things away, and over time you might work those back. But um, I don't see them as a team that I would favor to. Win the division, maybe in the South. South's still a little weaker, but I don't see them making a deep playoff run. I just look at it and I say, I think the Texans have the best receiver trio in the league. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of of a better three in the league, and I, I don't have one. Mm. Like, yeah, no, you might you might be right there. You might be right there. I think you're higher on Diggs than I am at this point. Okay. But, and Tank Dale did break his leg and shoot himself. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> so we'll have to that's see what he is when he comes back because the dude is 165 pounds at his yeah. heaviest. Uh, but, that's yeah, the skill, yeah. the skill's yeah. there. They got uh, Dalton Schultz at tight end. They definitely they definitely have a, a, a surplus of weapons around Stroud. So. They're like, I, I think I would put the Browns and Texans above the Jets and Bengals for sure. And Cowboys. And I, Cowboys. And Cowboys, for that matter, yes. I, I think Texans Ravens is an actual conversation. That's a great. Oh man, the AFC, AFC is. Just yeah, it's crazy. It, it is stacked. Um, so I'll do a quick little head count here. They have eight of the top twelve rosters being in the AFC. That sounds about right. And the next is another AFC opponent ahead of the Browns that I don't agree with. That is the Buffalo Bills. 
Oh, man. I feel like they've lost a lot. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like that there's been a lot of subtraction there, and they're counting on Allen to be able to elevate everything around them. Yep. And I'm not saying you can't do that to a degree, but I've, there's only so much you can do when you're facing these ultra talented rosters all around, all, it's just in your own division. There's you know? some. There's some interesting parallels between what the Chiefs did trading away Tyree Kill mm-hmm. and what the Bills have done trading away Stephon Diggs. And and mm-hmm. like Mahomes obviously did it. I mean, the Super Bowl champions. Yeah. Right. Um, and so they're they're I suppose they're gonna see if if Josh Allen can do the same thing. Yeah, it's that moment of truth scenario because you were like when they traded Tyreek, you're like, okay, was he the straw that stirred the drink? Right. And then you see them both be excellent away from each other. Do you know so what I mean? So it's like, okay, yeah. both can be true at the same time. Yes, Terry Kill was uh, an elite talent, but mm-hmm. it wasn't just that Mahomes is that dude. Yeah. And he can be that dude with Hardman or you just right. name a dude, like, put him out there. He'll make something. He'll make lemonade. You know what I mean? So can Allen do that? Like, okay. So she, uh, sorry, looking this up on the fly here. Um, I know, I know. Rashi Rice has has come under some fire lately, but his, but his rookie season, a little 79, 79 catches, nine hundred thirty eight yards, seven touchdowns. Like if Keon Coleman could have that type of season, for, I think the Bills would consider that a, a a great outcome for a rookie season. Keon Coleman, if he could yeah. replicate what Rice did. Uh, but now, obviously, they're not the same player and they're not the t- same type of skill set. But I'm just saying, like, if your rookie receiver comes in and, and is flirting with a thousand yards and and, you know, se- seven touchdowns like that's I, I think that's a, a great place to be. Yeah. Not a lot of rookies do. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's interesting to think about that. I, I think I don't think Allen is going to be able to do exactly like Allen is a great talent but I, I just don't think he is on that same tier as Mahomes Mahomes is by himself to me so he is he is not for me it's Mahomes than everyone else but I'll also say Mahomes does have Travis Kelsey yeah. uh, as his leading receiver as a tight end and I think we're heading towards a similar situation with Dalton Kincaid being the number one wide receiver from the tight end position in mm-hmm. Buffalo that's going to so, be really interesting to see because if Kincaid can take a step forward then all of a sudden it's like it's like you the Bills do still have a good defense, right? Mm-hmm. They, they still do. So um, I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. It's This is just such a quarterback weighted list because I'm yeah. like, yes, could the Bills be super talented? Yes, but I don't believe in their roster. If we're just evaluating the starting lineups the way it says we're doing here, it's hard for me. They've just lost a lot. Yeah. yeah they they're have. banking on Allen to make up a ton of difference on this. And right, Number 10 quarter- is someone I do agree with that I think should be higher. And if you had him ahead of Cleveland, I don't have an argument. The Philadelphia Eagles. Mm. Very talented roster, man. Yeah. Very little holes. They upgraded They upgraded their secondary, which was their biggest weakness last mm-hmm. year. Uh, they still got A.J. Brown and Devonta, Devonta Smith and, 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 and uh, uh, Dallas Goddard, for that matter. Yeah. Jalen Hurts is great. Uh, I think I think for the – I think from a roster standpoint – I would take the Eagles roster over the Browns, but I just don't know. They fell apart so badly last year. And now they've got Kellen Moore there as our offensive coordinator. So yes. it's like, can he get the the offense on track there? I, I I don't that remains to be seen. Well, that's the thing too, is because Shane Steichen was the OC. He goes to Indy, and you kind of like what the, he was doing with the with the Indy offense. Uh, and when Hertz injured his leg last year, they lost a lot of their threat. They lost a lot of because his ability to threaten the line of scrimmage from behind the line, it pulls everyone up, and then he's able to make things happen with his arm. Uh, and they also play with an extra down because of the tush push, which I think is a terrible name for something. I like the brotherly shove much better. But they also <laughs> lost their Hall of Fame center. Right. Like, well, what would that look like? But they did add Saquon Barkley. I can't True. act like that's nothing. You know what I mean? No. Like, he's a very dynamic player, and he's never been on a team this talented. So – be interesting to see what they could do. I think if you just look at the, the the rosters of Philly and Cleveland, very similar to how they are constructed from the inside out on okay. both lines of scrimmage. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the premier yeah. talent lies elsewhere because you have AJ Brown and you have Smith, mm-hmm. you know, but now they have a Chubb esque running back with Barkley 
So it kind of evens out a little more. I'd give, but um, I, I I couldn't argue with you if you had them above Cleveland. I think I think it. I wouldn't fair. either. Right. Yeah. And they don't have the edge rushers we do, but they have the defensive tackle. They're they're really healthy at DT, and they have good enough edge rushers. Mm-hmm. Okay, right ahead of Cleveland, number eleven, the Miami Dolphins. Where do you stand on that? I will say this: it's the fastest team I've ever seen assembled. Yes. Just from a pure speed standpoint, it's ludicrous what they've added there. Offensively, they are they are a juggernaut. I, I guess I guess it depends on on what the weather is outside because Tua's Tua, Tua's you know it's it's funny Tua's production falls off by month. There is a straight line down as it gets colder mm-hmm. with Tua's production. I saw that the other day, um, and we play them. Sunday night in late December. Right. In Cleveland. On the lake. Yeah, yeah. on the lake. So yeah, yeah, good luck with that, man. Noteworthy. I think I think they are very Tua driven. And especially I expect their defense to take a step back because uh Jalen Jalen Phillips got hurt late in the year for them. And uh, Bradley Chubb. Right. And Bradley Chubb. They yeah. lost a bunch of guys on and uh their like really good guard. I think was it Hunt signed with the Panthers? Um, so I, I think Mike McDaniel is a great coach and I think that they will be good offensively, but I don't know. I don't know how much I trust Tua as it gets later in the year. Uh, mm-hmm. and also to, just Tua's Tua's injury risk is, is probably as high for a quarterback as there is because if he gets concussed again, there's, there is that risk. I guess that's not really comparing the roster. So, so let's be fair. I just think their defense is suspect. The Browns have a great defense. Uh, and I, when, when you're looking at Tua and Deshaun Watson. Wow, that's tough. That's, that, that's tough. It's tough. Uh, but I know Deshaun Watson can play in the cold. So I'll take I'll take Deshaun Watson because until Tua play, proves he can play in the cold, it, it's a it's a long road to go through Kansas City, brother. Yeah, amen. Um, well, we'll touch a little bit on the Browns on this list at 12. Uh, in the article, it had the greatest strength as the edge, edge room. And had the greatest weakness as the running back room and the X factor being Deshaun Watson, which that's fair, but their assessment of Watson was off for me. I just think we're at a point right now where it's so like favorable, like it's popular just to pile on Watson Mm -hmm. as if he was just this awful player. And the games that he started and finished, they were four and one. I know wins are not a quarterback stat, but he had a 63% completion percentage and threw seven touchdowns to three interceptions. And he got hurt. If you extrapolate those numbers over the course of an entire season, I don't think you're saying your quarterback plays awful. Right. I think it's just above average, but with this roster, you're in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't know. I just think it's overblown how they, people act like he was just garbage. I'm not saying you confuse him with Patrick Mahomes either. I'm saying that there's a gray area in there, and he is still even at a diminut- what view diminished. Everybody keeps saying 2020 Deshaun Watson. I don't think 2020 Deshaun Watson's happening. I'm looking for 2018, 2019 Deshaun Watson. Okay. Where he's throwing 65 to 67% completion percentage, hovering around 4,000 yards, 26 to 28 touchdowns, around 10 interceptions. I think if you had that, I don't think we're like the sky's yeah. not falling all of a sudden. No, no. I think at that point you see the Deshaun restructure and you you might see the extension. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, that's a tough scenario. I don't know that the, the one thing I don't know about is the the quarterback contracts are getting so astronomical. Mm-hmm. It's like unless you have a dude that is truly just this elite difference maker, I think it's really hard to pay your franchise quarter with with, with what they're making. What uh, Trevor Lawrence and Joe Burrow are both making like is it is it like fifty million a mm-hmm. year? Now, yes, sir. That's that is that is now the cap's going to keep going up. I get that, but it's like when if they were potentially talking, into, let's say Deshaun has a good season, as you say, if you're if you're potentially talking an extension, that's 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 maybe they could structure it in a way that's favorable to them. Well, they always do that. That that, that mean like if we're looking at it right now. I mean, he's owed sixty three this year. But mm-hmm. his average per per year on the contract is eighth overall in the NFL right now. You know okay. what I mean? So, but if you told me we got the eighth best, if he played like the eighth best quarterback, 
Okay. Not no hire. Just say that's where he, he played this year. I think he'd be yeah. cool with that, right? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. If you got the if you got the eighth best court, I mean, we saw we saw the Lions be a couple plays away from going to the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. and I I, w- I don't know that Jared Goff was the eighth best quarterback in the league last year. He was good. He was definitely good. He, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I just think you can you can succeed if the roster around you is good enough. And I think the Browns roster is definitely good enough. The problem with quarterback uh, contracts is you're not allowed to pay a mid-level contract. If a guy gets re-upped, it's to reset the market. And it's just like Trevor Lawrence, I don't view him as a bust by any means. I'm not trying to paint in that light, but do I think he should have been a guy that set the market? I do not. You know, I just, but that's, if you're the next up, you're the next up. And yeah. that'll just keep going up. But when you have a receiver out there making thirty-five million a season, yeah, it's hard to justify paying a quarterback less. Well, that's why, like, I, I think on the other side of that coin, you know, you've got Daniel Jones making thirty million a year, forty million a year. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Giants paid him, and and you know, now all of a sudden, it's like they're talking about if if he's not good enough, that they they could have uh, uh, Broncos legend. His name escapes me. Right, Drew Locke. Broncos legend Drew Locke, yep. come on in Swag for him. Lord. Swag Lord, yeah, never forget that clip. Um, but and I think honestly, I think that's why Tua hasn't been paid yet, and that's why mm-hmm. Dak hasn't been paid yet because now Dak Dak has a better argument to me. I, I feel like Dak has that higher ceiling, but Tua, you know, it's like you're not sure if if you're if you're uh, succeeding because of Tua or because of the weapons around him. Right. And so it's McDaniel McDaniel's done an excellent job of utilizing that speed with motion, heavy stuff and getting the ball out of Tua's hands early because he's good at that part of the game. Yeah. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. The next time that Tua hits Tyreek Hill in stride on a deep ball will be the first time it happens. (laughs) Um, You're right. But, but if you play to the strengths of your quarterback, that's where it's like, is he a system quarterback? And then people, you know, people use that as negative, but then people also view like, well, he's in a quarterback friendly system as being negative. And I think if you're not running a quarterback friendly system, you need to fire offensive coordinator. You ever ever think about how, you know, Mike McDaniel comes from the Shanahan tree and it's like the two teams are kind of just mirrors of each other Mm -hmm. offensively. Right. Where you've got a quarterback that's, that's just good, but, but probably not great. And you've got, this embarrassment of riches around them and you mm-hmm. just you just make their life easy and and see how far you can go. Yeah, yeah, no, you're 100% right and that's the best case scenario when you do hire from a tree like that when you're trying to get the next hottest thing. You know what I mean? You've seen it for years people if, if you took a piss in a bathroom with Sean McVay, you got a gig. Yeah. Type thing. <laughs> well, that I like, guess what you're looking for is Mike, Mike McDaniel. I just think it's funny when we go back and we look at that play where like we're playing the Saints and or maybe the Ravens. I don't know. It's in 2014, and Johnny Manziel comes to the sideline and fakes yep. like he's going to go out, and they yep. send him on a route. He's talking to Mike McDaniel and Shanahan. McDaniel's standing right next, so awesome. he's he was in Shanahan's pocket forever mm-hmm. before he got this opportunity. So, mm-hmm. all right, let's actually get into some actual straight up just Browns talk now. Okay, this is our cornerback review right here, which is like one of the best things we could do. It's one of the funnest rooms. It's one of the best rooms yeah. per talent in the league. So when we talk cornerbacks in the Cleveland Browns, you're going to have to start with I me mean, not knowing my sides. Make them know your we're name. Start with, we're going to start with Denzel. Denzel Ward is going into his seventh season in the league. A clear cornerback one right now for the Browns. And Pro Bowl. And, and we're starting to see, like, the reason you go get a cornerback fourth overall is you think he can be a true difference maker. Mm-hmm. And when he is on the field, he has been a true difference maker for the Browns. There is a clear difference to what this defense is able to do and what they're able to pull off from a coverage standpoint when Denzel is out there. So when you look at cornerbacks across the league, where do you kind of, like, tier Denzel amongst the elite cornerbacks in the NFL? I think I, I think Denzel had like no matter how you order the elite corners in the league, um, like Sauce Gardner and Jair Alexander and uh, I'm not just like Patrick uh, Sertain from yeah from, that's another one. Are we are we still uh, calling Jalen Ramsey elite? 
it's weird because now he's not viewed as just a corner. Now he's like viewed as just this weapon that can play mm-hmm. safety slot, you know, do everything. Right. But I, no matter how you order them or where you order them, I think Denzel Ward has to be in there because when he is, when he is on the field, the, the wide receiver that he's covering is rarely targeted. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. And for good reason. I, I still think of the the iconic uh, pick six he had uh, when Joe Burrow was targeting Jamar Chase. Mm-hmm. Those photos are, are are awesome. But I think you know we've seen him uh, be healthier recently, and and you know what? Um, I think the the biggest credit to the Browns secondary as a whole, and I know we're going to talk about all of them, is that the NFL in a, on a league wide basis is shifting more to a zone uh, heavy format scheme more more teams than ever are playing zone rather than man whereas the browns played way more man last year than Mm -hmm. almost any team right and that's because you've got these sticky corners that stay on there and it all starts with denzel ward right yeah yeah for sure i i just think i just think he is he is the 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 most important piece of that secondary to to me and 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 it's it's so good, especially as the NFL changes and there's there's a lot of these smaller, uh, quicker, nimble wide receivers that you've got to cover. It's like Denzel Ward fits so well on those guys, um, so easily. So when I think of just skill sets, I think his ability to do mirror technique is the best in the league. Oh, I think he's the best in the league at that specific technique. And to your point, the uptick of man coverage, I think Jim Schwartz has always wanted to do that. He just didn't have the pieces. So he kind of right. got like, like he kind of got like horny, like, oh, shit, I, <laughs> I can just run straight up man. I have the guys that can pull that off. Now, we need they definitely need to be able to throw some wrinkles in there and, and yeah. confuse quarterbacks a little more often. Because, man, you can also run off man and do those long drag routes and get rubs and, and find ways to get your guys open still. But just in one-on-one situation when Denzel presses and that mirror technique, it is a thing of beauty. Um, the elephant in the room is the injury concerns. Yep. Um, he missed four games last year, which I feel unfortunately is like par for the course. Now I think you, I, you, I think you, you have to at least count him missing at least two games, probably for every year. I think that's just, it's the trade-off, I guess, for having a guy who's that quick twitched. Now we just have to hope the injury isn't concussion related. Right. Because that man is in the Tua zone to where a bad concussion, we don't he might have to sit out the rest of the year. Yeah, we can't career we can't could be in jeopardy. Worries. Yeah, you're right. Uh so uh, I think I think you started this conversation off with the with the the number one piece about Denzel Ward. When he's on the field, he's great. So mm-hmm. As long as as long as you have him on the field, you know that you can rely on him. Well, let's shift over to CB two. MJ Emerson, the other guy on the outside. Um, count me in this group. The night he was drafted, I was baffled. I didn't even have corner being in like a need at all. Newsom was coming off a pretty good rookie year. Do I feel right. really good about where he was at on the outside? And I think they just seen something too good to pass up. We just weren't in on it yet. Became apparent immediately the first time you see him on the field, preseason game against Jacksonville. Game that means nothing, but he's different. He, he's just yep. a different yep. cat. Yep. Um, and this is where I wish our, our guy Jacob was here. Jacob has an affinity, a, a, a certain, a, a deep love for MJ Emerson. Uh, and it's warranted, man. He, that dude is so fun to watch. He's a dog. And for me, he Jacob. I'm, I think I, I think CB one in uh twenty twenty five isn't off the table. You know what? L- let me just apologize because normally uh Jacob's running the spaceship here, and I forgot to look at the comments. I was just looking at Casey's pretty face, and so you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fatal mistake right there. Don't don't do that. It's like Medusa. Um, but M- MJ Emerson, I think that what he is for this defense is he's the grit. He's, you know what I mean? He's like, he's a guy that receivers hate to go up against because how physical he is. He's, he's on you the entire game. He's just, it's a different mentality. He does something different than Denzel. Denzel is that mirror technique. It's twitch. It's, it's straight up just 
Velcro coverage as opposed to Emerson, who's it's it's a dirtier thing. There's going to be more hands. It's going to be more holding. It's going to be more physicality. Right. You know, and it's it's an attitude thing, and it's an attitude thing that transfers not to only coverage but into the run game. And for that reason, just the style of play that he comes with week in and week out, he is my favorite member of this entire secondary. Oh wow. I just think, to your point, I just think there is such a a great dynamic between the skill sets of Denzel Ward and Martin Emerson, right? Like when you look at the receivers you have to cover in, in the AFC North, right? Like like Denzel Ward is going to be great against Zay Flowers. Denzel Ward was great against Deontay Johnson. I know he's moved on to Carolina. Mm -hmm. But then you've got Martin Emerson for guys like T Higgins and George Pickens uh, and, and the bigger guys. And so it's like, no matter what the the teams want to throw at you, whether it's the, the, the big uh, size advantage receiver or the quick twitchy route runner receivers, the, the Browns have a receipt. have, have a DB that can match up with you. And that is just such an unbelievable luxury. And for, for Emerson, Emerson to come in, it, especially as a third round pick and be as good as he has already is, is just such a home run. It, it, it's like those picks that you wanted the Browns to make for so long and they just couldn't seem to find them. And you'd watch all these other teams do it. And it's like, here, the Browns did it. They, they found this stud corner in, in round three that was so good that, so, so in case you made this point about, about Greg Newsom, I, I didn't think Greg Newsom was just like, decent as a rookie i thought he was legitimately good mm -hmm. as a rookie mm -hmm. and so to push him inside because you're playing so well is a real credit to emerson and just like how good he's been he's just physical he he, he makes you uncomfortable uh he's got a nose for the ball he, he, he i i still think about him picking off trevor lawrence last year it was awesome uh, and i really think we we saw the beginning of the breakout and 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 that the respect for him and, I, and and JOK especially Emerson and JOK is is coming, and and I, I think we we just as Browns fans are much closer to it and know yeah uh, know already. Yeah, and I throw Delpit in that list as well. But when it comes to Emerson, we're talking about a guy who's been in the league two years, played a ton of snaps. That's that's a great question, MC. I I know this Emerson's been in the league and played a ton of snaps. Dude ain't gave up a touchdown yet. He has yet to give up a touchdown in his career. That is, that's a banana stat. That's my, my guy. I got to do what a great. That's a great tweet, Casey. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to put that one away for another day. Well, it's, it's. I do think that he was slighted last year. He doesn't have the name. He's a third round pick. If he had been drafted in the first round and played the way he's played, I think he makes the Pro Bowl at minimum, probably second team All Pro. Agreed. That's the way he played last year. You know and. Uh, I do think that uh, MC brings up a good point. Anybody with a better corner room than the Browns? I don't know because you can point to teams that have two good corners, but can you point to a team that has three? There's, it's so few and far between, man. And our third cornerback that we're going to talk about is Greg Newsom. And right. to the point is he was drafted 26 overall in, in 2021. Uh, I was shameless plug again. I was on sports for CLE and there was a segment we didn't get to, but I got to read it. And they did a, a organization did a redraft of that 21 draft. They still had him in the first round. He fell back two spots. They had the okay. Browns taking Javon Holland at 26, the safety mm -hmm. from Miami. And they had Newsom going two two spots later. So they're still saying he's a first round talent. That doesn't happen. And when you see redrafts of the 2022, Emerson's always in the first round now. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. That's the way it's viewed. So even though like we're spoiled because we have two top flight corners, Newsom is still a top at least 50 corner, probably closer to 30 in the NFL. And for all three of those guys to be on the same team, it's it's almost like cheating, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know if they're going to be able to balance that and keep all three. I hope they can over time. We'll see how this plays out. But uh, Newsom doesn't get – he gets crapped on a lot. And a lot of it has to do with the celebrating. Have you noticed? I guess that's probably the, the number one gripe on Newsom. He yeah. celebrates too much. Um, but the reality is, man, he's a damn good cornerback. It's just he's – I don't think – I think he's being played out of position because you have Emerson. 
To, to your point, though, I remember when Newsom really over the top celebrated a tackle for loss he had against Chicago. Mm-hmm. It's like the Browns were down, uh, I think, multiple scores at that point. And I was like, why are you celebrating? And it's like, sure enough, the Browns came back, man. Like, yeah. like sometimes you need that type of energy on your teams for like a guy to just be uh, unfazed by the game situation. Like I get I get it can be it can look bad if you're getting killed or like if you're losing or whatever, but it's just like, sometimes you need that guy to like not let everybody's body language get bad and like yeah. not let the mentality get bad and just say, Hey, we're in this. We are, we're, we are the Cleveland Browns and we've come back a billion times before. And we're going to keep like, that was the whole theme of the season, you know? And, and I think, I think too, Newsom deserves a lot of credit because it's gotta be hard for a guy. Number one, we we've been over this before inside corners get paid less, right? But for mm-hmm. him to accept moving from the outside where we have already established, he played well yeah. to move inside uh, for, for what the team needs. And, and then, and to, to do everything he could, like, I think that's a tremendous credit to him. And, and you know what, especially when you're in a situation where we've already said, if Denzel Ward's given missing, let's say three games a year, right? Mm-hmm. You want Greg Newsom on your team because he Newsom is more similar to Ward than he is to Emerson. Yes. Which yeah, right. So yeah. so if you need somebody else on the outside, I would I would feel great about Newsom being on the outside compared to to a random cornerback 3 of another team. Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think that's a question. Right. Um he obviously in his second year when he got pushed inside when Emerson got there, he was reluctant and it felt like he was being used like a linebacker and there was a, a little bit of pushback from him, but he seemed to buy in last year in Schwartz's scheme. And we'll see how that plays out. I I don't want to go too far in advance with this, but I do think that there is a world in which they move on from Ward because of the injuries. Oh, wow. Oh. Because in 2026, they don't owe him any money. The, the guaranteed money will be gone by 2026. Uh, so they might just try to hold on to Newsom until then and then position them back outside. And then with what you have with Cam Mitchell or potentially maybe even Miles Harden, maybe sure. you fill that nickel role there. But I'm getting, I'm getting too far here. Okay. Let's okay. talk about some other people in this room. Let's talk about Cam Mitchell. Yeah. Cam Mitchell, teammate of Greg Newsom at Northwestern, roommates, I do believe. And uh, comes into a situation where you're in a very talent heavy room. And he was thrown in the duty quicker than I thought we than than we thought he would. Yeah. Yep. And he had no problem swimming. Right away, he looked like he belonged. Um, but because of the talent in front of him, kind of a similar situation this year. I don't know how much he's going to see the field without injury. Mm-hmm. But I feel confident off what I saw last year that they he has he has starting level ceiling to me. How do you feel about him? I agree. I I think. I think it's 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 interesting how these guys keep getting drafted and we say, OK, they've got time to develop and, and they won't see the field. And then suddenly they're thrust into action and, <laughs> yeah. and especially the cornerbacks play well. I still think about Cam Mitchell tackling Justin Fields short of that of that first down. On Bears game down. Once again, coming up where corners making tackles that. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and Cam Mitchell forces that turnover. And that is that it, the, the Browns don't win that game without cam mitchell's tackle on justin fields there right they, they, they don't win because, because the bears pick up that first down and there's no time left in that game to really mount the comeback that they do uh but so so my point is i, I think you know a guy that was again a later fifth round pick fifth round if i'm not mistaken i don't my head wants to say six but yeah fifth's probably right okay fifth or sixth um, round pick guy that, that gets called into action and plays well. I mean, that is that's a home run scenario. That this we, we saw so many late round picks for so long, just just not even make the roster or, or contribute mm-hmm. nothing. And it's like for Cam Mitchell to come in like he did, uh, makes me all the more optimistic about Miles Harden. But uh, cer- certainly, I, I, I'm still scarred from I think it, it was the Freddie Kitchens year when literally the top four corners were all injured. Yep. Pulled muscles, every one of them. Every one of them, hamstrings and, and the like. Yeah. And and so to see Mitchell play that way, it gives me confidence. I, I I really I felt good about him. His rookie year wasn't wasn't like a huge 
um, contribution, but when you have such a stacked cornerback room, uh, that's not that's not what the expectation is. And so I was really encouraged by what we saw. All right. Well, I want to talk about what I think is the most under the radar guy who has an opportunity here. Okay. And that is Khalifa Lossi. Hmm. This team is very high on him. He was he was undrafted, went to the Kansas City Chiefs. They picked him up from their practice squad. Excellent length. I think they view him as an outside guy. Uh, because of the numbers game, he is someone that I think they're very high on, but they may try to get sneaky and try to sneak on the practice squad. A fifth. fifth. Cam Mitchell was in the fifth. Thank you. Good call. I'm, I'm just glad Big Brother's watching out for us, yeah. keeping us honest here on this podcast. Love you. Um, but Halasi is someone they're very high on. I think he has outside skills, good length, and I think that he could be a piece down the line and someone who could spot start now. You know, like if you, if you had to have for a game, two games, I think he can handle those duties. Um, and when you look at the, the bottom of this room, the one guy that we haven't talked about at all is Justin Hardy. Mm. He's a special teamer. He's Mike Ford 2.0. He's like a better version of Mike Ford. Mike Ford played excellent special teams, actually played decent a few times when he was called upon to, to jump in a game. He got exposed as well because you don't want to see him on the field a ton in coverage. But he, he but I think Hardy is a lock on this roster because of what he does in special teams. So that's one spot. We know who the top three spots are, and I think Cam Mitchell's a lock as well. So those are five. I don't think you walk into the season with seven. I think you probably go in with six. Okay. So it's going to be Khalif Halasi, Miles Harden, or Vincent Gray. No one really talks about Vincent Gray. Another guy out of Michigan, good length, uh, I think is going to compete for an outside job. Because there's draft capital spent on Miles Harden, which we did a rookie review. You guys can go back here on the playlist that Jacob set up. Check out the Miles Harden review. We haven't seen him do anything as a pro yet, so it's kind of hard to speak on what he is. Sure. We have an idea of what he could be. I think I think it's going to come down to Miles Harden or Khalif Halasi to make this roster. And oh, they're wow. going to try to sneak the other one on the practice squad. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's a numbers game. Um, I think, I don't know. Who do you think has the better chance of being snuck onto the practice squad? Khalif Halasi or Miles Harden? Probably Halasi. But this is also where I'm skewed on Harden because I didn't think Harden would be available in the seventh round. So maybe the league thinks different on Harden than I do. I I just think that in general, uh, there is more excitement about somebody that's less known. And the known products seem to, you know, what, like halasi has been in the league um, for a little bit now. I'm not sure how many years, but, but obviously he's not a rookie. Um, and so I think that there's less excitement about those guys and more excitement mm-hmm. about the, the dudes that are younger and, and just coming in the league. Excuse me. So I, I guess I, I guess I agree. I agree that Halasi is probably easier to sneak on the practice squad. But because he plays outside, will he be more coveted? That, that's where it comes down is usage, you know. And and this is something else I'm hearing as of late. There is now thoughts that maybe Horden could also play some safety. Oh, really? And give you more versatility in that. And don't get me wrong. If you watch the kid and run support, you could see where he could definitely, you know, you could sneak that kid in the box and he could do some damage being that hybrid nickel safety player. Mm. So I think he might provide more value, but once again, it's an unknown commodity, you know, but mm-hmm. we did, we, we did snatch Halsey off a practice squad. So someone could very easily do the same thing to us. That's fair. Yeah. That's a good point. I think, I think no matter how you slice it, this is a great cornerback mm-hmm. room. There's a lot mm-hmm. to be excited about. There's a ton of talent, probably more talent than most most cornerback rooms, which is certainly a credit to the Browns and their drafting. Well, MC asked earlier, and I don't – I can't think of one with better. No, I, I don't I have any, a better any one for you either. But that's also predicated that Denzel's healthy. With the, when Denzel's healthy and you're, you're at full power – this is probably the best cornerback room in the NFL, all total. And you I might agree. come up with people that think they're not the best duo, but those are also people who aren't near as high on MJ Emerson as we are. Mm-hmm. Like I think that I think MJ Emerson has Pro Bowls in his future. 
I think that I if he too. if he has the same exact season he had last year again, I think it be, he becomes undeniable. You know what I mean? So yeah, him and JOK are on that same. Mm-hmm. And, and honestly, Grant Talbot, I, I think yep. Grant Talbot, JOK, and Martin Emerson all could thrust themselves into that conversation in a hurry if the defense is good again. Yeah, it, and I, I and I might be on an island with this. I expect the defense to be better this year than they were last year. Oh wow! Like I, I year two of the same system to hear them talking here, Schwartz. Like year one's about implementation. Year two's when we start to build on that on the base that you've built. I just think that if you look at the areas they could get better in, they weren't good in the red zone last year. No, between the twenties, they were lethal. Teams couldn't move the ball. But it seemed like after you cracked that and you got in the red zone, there seemed to be less resistance and team had more success. So they got to figure out ways to lock that down. Obviously, we hear a lot about the baseball analogies. They got to come up with a, a curveball, an mm-hmm. off-speed pitch. Their fastball is excellent, but they need to come up with some other things they can do. I just think if you just see a few little tweaks here or there, you know, and be better on quick change scenarios. There were several times because this offense turned the ball over at an alarming rate. If the offense just handles their business and doesn't put the defense in so many terrible positions, I think you see a better overall outcome. Um, but yeah, you got to love where this is at. And this is the strength is the pass rush mixed with what they can do in the cornerback room. That's what get, makes this defense lethal. You know, so we will, we've talked edge, we've, we just talked corner, two massive strengths and two rooms that I would put up with any other room in the league. I completely agree, which is. A weird, fun place to be as a Browns fan because it's been exceptionally rare mm-hmm. previously, and now it seems like it very well could be here to stay for years to come. Yeah, and with the cornerback room, a lot of that's because I think we have faith in Andrew Barry's ability to to draft corner. Right, he's he just kept keeps knocking out of the park, and we haven't seen like we're not sold on Cam Mitchell because we didn't see him in extended service, but it's like it looks like it's trending in the right way. Mm-hmm. Miles Harden could go even further to boosting that feeling. So it is, it's, it's an excellent place to be. And we should be grateful that we get to watch these corners play every Sunday. Yes, we do. And, and you know what? I think we've been waiting for the Browns to have a truly like, so the Browns have put together some years where they've had like good offenses, but the defense by far has been the more lacking unit. And so it's really cool now to see them play so well, be the unit that gives up the, the least yards per game in the NFL. Uh, and, and hear Jim Schwartz talk about, yeah, last year we knew we couldn't do everything. Uh, we, we knew we only had a limited amount of time to get really good at something. Well, this year we're going to add more. And, like, I get it. Like, some of that could just be coach speak. But yeah. it's great to hear him say it. Well, Schwartz don't bullshit. If he said it, he meant it. You right. know what I mean? We'll see if they can actually pull it off. That's a separate thing. Mm-hmm. All right, well, that wraps up our cornerback review. So now we're going to do something we haven't done in a while. We should come on here and kind of talk about what we've been watching. Well, me and Nick have been watching the same thing. Same thing that oh, Jacob's yeah. been watching, The Boys. The Boys is in the four episodes through season four. There's only eight episodes to go, or eight total. So they're, they're at the halfway point right now. And the next episode, season five, drops in the middle of sometime after you watch this. If you watch this on Thursday – the episode's already out. And I've seen a lot of people panning this season saying that it's like on a bit of a downturn. I could not disagree more. Season four of The Boys has been excellent. Absolutely excellent. It is delivered from every aspect where we're talking about, because some, some, some big part of The Boys is the shock value that that show can bring and some things that they'll throw at you just to see how you react as an audience. And they have done it in every episode, sometimes multiple times. And things that when they first introduce it and they're about to do it, you don't know if you're going to be able to get through it yourself, let alone the character on the screen. Uh, And if you're listening to this right now and you've watched the first four episodes of season four, you know a few that I'm talking about. There's been a couple things they've thrown at you that it's like, are we are we about to are we about to fucking do this? We about to we about to watch. The deep blow a train, like <laughs> you don't know where this is going, you know what I mean? So, this season has been unbelievably entertaining. Um, and I'm gonna let Nick get into it, but I do want to throw this out there before I do. Anthony Starr as Homelander 
might be one of the greatest casting to character development things I've ever seen in television. It's he was born for this man. To do the character of Homelander is so batshit crazy for someone to step into that role and embody it. And when you watch it, you don't think you're you're watching Homelander. And it's 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 must see TV, not for the squeamish. Don't let your children watch it. But if you need a batshit show to captivate you, man, and you're not watching the boys, I don't know what you're doing in your life. It's so interesting to me how a show that revolves around super powered individuals uh, hits so close to home in so many facets in, in, mm-hmm. in the real world. But I, I got to say, OK, so my favorite my favorite villain of all time is still Heath Ledger's Joker. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, that's that's rare air for me. But Homelander and Anthony Starr playing that i've seen that he's complained about people treating him in real life like he's homelander like they see him and and, then like that's how you know you play a great character i just he's he's unbelievable and episode four dives a lot more deeply into his character Mm -hmm. which i really enjoyed um you know what i I think what's what really stuck out to me in in episode four uh was just the way that 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 this show doesn't it doesn't so clearly define good and bad. It like kind of exposes all of these people for their mm-hmm. flaws and the yep. and, and the shitty things about them, whether it was was Starlight with with some of her stuff with Firecracker exactly. in a previous life, right? Yeah. Um uh, and, and you know they expose that and or or like um uh, you know when when they dive into Homelander stuff, they're like exposing some of the 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 hardships that he went through you know as he was coming up right and and so it's like no matter who it is that they, they, they're despite even if they're super powered they're also human and it's just such a rare i feel like for so long it's like superheroes are very clearly defined good it's good bad you know what i mean super powered people and so this this there's such a gray line here and i feel like that's like such a big part of what makes it so good like all the characters are flawed all of them yeah. have and so and so you're i don't know i i don't know that it's like you're rooting for a side specifically like not to say like i, I did that like some of the people calling homelander the hero or, or that's that's we're not we're not that is not what i'm doing here but yeah I, no, but, but we talk about like villains like like Thanos. Yeah. Thanos had this edge to him. Like the, the best villains, they don't, they're not being evil just for the sake of being evil. They have some sort of motive in their head that makes it feel like that they're operating the way they need to, to make something happen. Whether right. with Thanos that was getting resources to the, to the universe. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Now it comes off like a psychopath, but if you just like break it apart, you can see why he's doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Like, and then you made an excellent point, man. Every time you think you have a beat on one of these guys, they throw a curveball at you. Yeah. You know, like you do think you have a beat. like, okay, the, this, like, I think the closest thing they have to a good guy in, in any of this is, is Huey. Yeah. Yeah. So probably. like all this shit's just happening to him. Right. But like, but every other character, man, there's, there's good parts and bad parts and they, they just keep like shifting it, man. It's, it's excellent storytelling. And like you said, that mirrors a lot of what's happening in today's society. And a lot of people are getting their fucking feels about it. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. Oh yeah. are all of a sudden feeling targeted watching this show. But uh, I don't know, man, it's been excellent. And it's, it was an excellent thing to happen because superhero movies had become so sterile had, had yes. become for yes. to have this subset, which existed in comics that I did not read. And I read comics. I'm aware of some of the things that have happened that we haven't seen yet that I don't think we'll see some things. I think we might, but I just think that they've the balls to bring this to the screen has Mm -hmm. been exceptional. And thanks Seth Rogen for doing it. He's the, he's the guy that made all this happen, man. Oh, is it really on the shelf for 10 years? Actually, Simon Pegg, who plays Huey's dad was the inspiration for Huey in the comics. And he just aged out. So Simon Pegg, which we may or may not get to see going forward. Um, he was supposed to be Huey originally, which I think is crazy. Interesting. And then yeah. they did that in Seth Rogen and, and uh, Simon Pegg did that movie, Paul, about the alien. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe 2010 or 11. 
I wonder if that's when this came up because this thing was bought by several studios who owned the rights to it and couldn't make it happen. And eventually it got into the hands of Seth Rogen. Mm. Seth Rogen produced this thing and now we get the boys. I think it's, it's, it's really paving the way for other things to come after it. And I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to see where, where things go. Um, because it's just so different. Like I, I, I know it's not exactly the same, but I really liked Peacemaker, and we'll see if if, oh, yeah, dude. if, if that keeps going. Giant yeah. Cena is great in that. Um, Vigilante would also live in this universe too. I could see okay. that character living yeah. in this universe from Peacemaker. Absolutely, and like Invincible, which is also on Prime, is another one that's 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 really good and and kind of um, has some of this stuff. And it's just interesting to see where things are going. And so um, I think, I think, uh, which shout out to Prime, by the way, they don't release the episode at like 10 p.m. on Thursday night for those of us that have to wake up at the, the before it's light outside, right? I think it's like 10 a.m., 10 a.m., something like that. And uh, all I know is that I will be seated and ready for episode five. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. Yeah. I do want to throw a curveball at you at the end of this before we jump okay. off here. Okay. When we think about characters who are cast into certain roles and it, it works or it doesn't work, I think we can agree that Anthony Starr is Homelander home run. Yeah. I can think of one other actor that I could, I think could have pulled this off. I think Glenn Howerton from Always Sunny, I think that he could have been Homelander. I don't know who Glenn, Glenn Howerton are you is. Familiar with, are you familiar with Always Sunny? I am. Okay. I just don't know actors. I, or yeah, I just don't know. Who, right. who, who, what uh, character? So you got Charlie Day, obviously. You got you got Rob McElhenney who plays Mac, and then you have Dennis. Dennis is Glenn Howerton. Oh. I, I think that that actor could have pulled this off. Not I don't know to this degree, but I think he has. There's a little bit of Homelander in Dennis. Like they're just I, I can see that. You know I what I mean? Like, yeah. There's a little bit of a Dennis vibe. So if you disagree with me, agree with me, hit me up in the comments. Let me know if I'm an idiot. I probably am. Um, but I've I've enjoyed this season of the boys. I think that this is their best work. I know some people don't agree with that. I just think that this is and you're only getting five seasons. Yeah. Yeah. So this is building towards something. And and uh I'm actually I'm looking. I'm hoping we get Soldier Boy back at some point. That would be really cool. Um, my my hat in the ring for for the actor. I think they could play it. Um, he's uh, he's in Mad Men, and he's also uh, the the main. I guess you could call him the villain in Baby Driver. Um, I don't know his name, but he's typically got the slick back, uh, black hair. I John feel like Ham. I think it's John Ham. Was feel he like in the town? movie the town i know the town i don't remember if he was in the town but he's the main guy in mad men and don also, draper yeah yes yes that is john ham okay i feel like john ham could do yeah. it i feel like john ham would be another guy that like i like that really good at being bitter and just and, a sociopath right right yeah. absolutely but anyway i i, I want to say we are still carrying over 200 people here uh as we currently sit and that's crazy to me Thank you all. I thank you. You have no idea how much we appreciate this. Um, uh, and Jacob weighs in as saying Black Noir from the comics will not be happening. Uh, they can provide. I did see that. I mm -hmm. guess in the comics, he's a he's a Homelander clone. Yep, he's a fell safe. Okay, and so and so we're not doing that. So we're going a different route. Which kudos to them, right? Mm -hmm. Make it your baby. It's so good. Make it your baby. Make it fun. Uh, but but to everybody, uh, you know what? We've been growing on YouTube. Uh, we just hit 350 subs, which, you know, this is a new uh, channel. And, and and a lot of people like the Jaguars preview. So thank you to everybody for clicking that like, the, the subscribe, the, the comics, the, the, the whole things. Anybody that's with us here on our not even our normal regular day. It means the world to us. Um, and we've got all kinds of fun things planned for you. So with that being said, this has been a quarterback cornerback review episode of the barking brown show and nick he whoa i can't point that way this hand he's casey go browns mr jacob mr jacob